Hello friends! This is People Are Interesting with Jan K. In each episode of this show, unique individuals share stories that take us on a ride across ideas and places. Featuring crocodile attacks in Indonesia, escaping war-torn Lebanon, and shark protection schemes in Mauritania. This podcast takes you where you've never been before. Enjoy and thank you for joining the club. And we're running. Dan Donovan, thank you so much for being here. So today we're talking about route setting. For those of us who might not know what it is, would you care to explain what you do? Cool. So I'm Dan. Uh, yeah, just disclaimer, just like the last episode we've done as well. Um, I'm quite new to all of this. Uh, in essence, compared to a lot of my uh, colleagues, um, so there's a few things that might get a little bit wrong or uh, might not be super accurate, so don't hold me uh, hostage for all of these things. But the, the art of route setting essentially is uh, um, creating uh, climbs for, for people in indoor scenarios, the most simple terms. So if you've ever been to a climbing wall or seen a climbing structure, whether it's indoor or outdoor, but like a man-made one, there'll generally be like colorful holds, like shapes on the wall, which you grab onto, we call holds obviously. Um, and our job is to create those routes for people, um, whether yeah, it's indoor, outdoor, commercial or competition. There, there's people who cater for all, all different styles of, of it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's one of my jobs. Yeah. How did you get into it? So I got into it uh, kind of the, the older school method or one of the methods still used viably now is I worked at a climbing wall. I worked at, uh, uh, on just on the counter and I was doing a little bit of instructing um, and some safety work and the kind of like apprentice trainee guy before me, he was going to uni and I was kind of sick of working on the counter. Um, it was kind of just like a bit stifling working on it. It was just an in-between sort of thing. I needed some, some cash um, and I wanted to work at the wall because I really enjoyed working there. I wanted, I was kind of hell bent on becoming an instructor, which is like the furthest thing I'm doing now. Um, and I just said to the, the headsetter one day, I was like, hey, like if you need a hand washing holds or anything that gets me from working indoors, like I've been on the counter all day, like, give me a shout, like I, I work hard, like I can do manual labor, like sort of thing. I wasn't really that interested in actually becoming a root setter. It wasn't really like on my agenda. I just wanted something else to do. And uh, he was like, sure, like give us a hand. And kind of from there, I just fell in love with it. And, uh, and it's kind of been four odd years now since, since I started. Oh, you've been doing it for four years already. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's flown by. No, I yeah. say it, it's crazy. Obviously, with COVID included, like the yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think I I remember when I met you, and it must have been like two thousand, maybe early twenty twenty. It was so yeah. I remember. I remember you were obviously you were already doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Fair play. So you're a route setter in my land, right? Yeah. Shout out to my land. Amazing place. Um, what's the what's the um, kind of history behind the place of, of, of my land in terms of like not only the climbing but it's also kind of a community hub and you know now you work there yeah so my is one of the oldest climbing walls in the world like it's up there in probably the top five or top ten oldest walls in, in the world yeah we're, we're pretty well established we're pretty well known throughout the world just because of the history of how long it's been there uh, the building itself is, is actually situated on the Regent's Canal um, in, in East London, uh, in Mile End, so it's kind of, it's embedded into that sort of proper East London vibe. Um, it used to be, a, 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 I can't, I'm pretty sure it was like a pipe making warehouse, like a factory, so there's like loads of things in there, they're like bending pipes and stuff. Um, we've been there since, uh, I think, unofficially like 86, mm -hmm. I think it is. Unofficially first. Yeah, people like, there's still speculation whether that's the official date or that's, that's just the, the, the date that they like coined the name or something like mm -hmm. um yeah we've been there a while we've been there a long time well one of the the originals around um we we cater for both bouldering and for for ropes i think we always have pretty much from the early days um ropes was a little bit after bouldering because it took a bit longer to build um the building itself as well has got some cool history like the monkey house we've got like a thing called the monkey house which is a room you can kind of climb through the roof and do like circuits around and, and lap into to, to each other uh, that used to be used by the uh, was it the north london commando rescue training mm -hmm. so there's actually like a there was a swimming pool in there oh really yeah they used to like oh. sink boats and capsize things and they used to do loads of commando rescue training yeah it's, there's some cool little in the monkey room yeah in the monkey house that's what it was used for whenever uh I get comments from 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 the the owners of Kilter Grips. Shout out to 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 Jackie and Ian. Um, mm -hmm. They're always kind enough to comment on some of our posts, and and often she'll just quote saying like, 
East London Commando Centre, like then that'll just be it because they know that like they know from the old school what it came from. So, uh, and and the wall itself is cool because it's it's gone through all the phases of indoor wall styles basically in in the industry because it was originally like breeze blocks and like concrete holds basically, and then it kind of went into the fiberglass prepaid panels with the whole centre was basically cracks mm -hmm. and like pre made on the panels themselves much like the traverse walls uh, are, are, that are like there now that, did you ever climb on the red uh, red slab which one is red you know red like slab? in the in the main room as you walked in you went left and there's like the little like bit before the rope bay did uh -huh. you ever climb on that before we renovated it no okay so that was like one of the last things as well there was like a, a slab that was red and it was like mainly features but then there were places for, for holes to go so that kind of was the evolution of climbing walls was like it started out with like a lot of places just started out with just like traverse, like a lot of people started out just traversing brick walls and stuff and then that kind of like moved indoors and they built these structures and then ch like developments changed. Like the one in the garden, trackside, like the, mm -hmm. the gray one where you just use the features for your feet. That yeah. was like, lots of centers were just that and places still are just like that. Um, my lens has obviously evolved over the years and that's why it's been sort of like a, a, a staple in the climbing industry. Um, so it's cool to have seen it change from, from fiberglass to wooden panels and then like obviously the holds as well will changed over the years from being like everyone used to use crimps there was no big holds um, they were mm. like a, a moderate sized jug now would have been enormous back then like you wouldn't have had holds like that everything was very small because there wasn't as much space to put them on the walls because the fiberglass the panels don't sit flat a lot of the time so the, the space you have to put a hold on is very small like even the, the track side wall we use a lot of small holes because you can't put big things on because they won't sit flat and it's obviously not safe right so yeah it's quite interesting that we've, we've still got a bit of history like if you ripped the whole center out basically like when we did some renovation over the last few years we ripped out like one of the overhangs and behind like the cave there's all the crack panels are still there oh really it's really cool yeah, we, yeah. i wish i wish we could have left one and perspexed it would have been really cool because it would have been like the cave and then like a panel and then the slab but they couldn't do it for some reason because of the structure but yeah, behind all those walls is like the original climbing wall. Well, let's let's actually talk about the evolution of indoor climbing. Yeah. What's how how has it changed over the years? Where was this kind of starting point? You you already touched upon it a little bit, but maybe we could kind of like go through the whole timeline if possible. So for ah uh, man, indoor climbing uh, for me especially, I've not been climbing massively long, like consistently as well. Like I climbed a bit when I was younger and on and off with the scouts and stuff. So. Um, I have only been in climbing at my end. Kind of started again when I was like, it sounds like nine years ago, but I started a little bit again when I was 21, but I was still fighting. So I kind of did it on and off. I wasn't there consistently as I am now. Um, but indoor climbing in general, like kind of just was a thing of like, tr it was like training really for the outdoors. And that's what it was for a long, long time was just you like obviously living in Britain, weather's pretty shitty. Um, we don't get the most consistent weather all the time. And, um, yeah, I think it sort of started from that, just getting people, letting people get into shape, started mainly like in people's garages and stuff, I think. And then, yeah, more and more commercially viable places opened. Um, and now we've just hit an explosion of of the industry again. Like it's always had big explosions over the years from what I get told um, from other people that I work with have been been around for the whole, whole of it. Uh, and now it's just another one, obviously. Uh, the Olympics and Free Solo are probably our two biggest pushes um, uh, and obviously like people like Sean O'Coxey who, who was our Olympian um, made that even more because we had a, an Olympian in there because obviously there was only like a finite amount of spaces per, per nation and, and uh, oh, for everyone really like not everyone got someone in because it was quite a small event so I think yeah we've had a massive push in the last few years and especially in London you'll see how many walls have opened like we were just talking about this before we started there's been like a surge like an insane surge of new walls and, and the demand is there so so it's quite nice to see that like it's turned from being like a very lifestyle driven like niche sport like i think climbers were always like the outcasts yeah the it's dirt not bags. the dirt bags the outcasts the, the freaks of the world sort of thing and you still do get those people people love being like labeled as that in one sense i think and and uh it's cool to see that like it's now become more like a gym i guess yeah. in one sense like i guess as well like in london rent is expensive so you can't hope out that like a bunch of dirt bags who are scraping chalk off the floor are going to pay your bills um <laughs> as much as we would love that in one sense but i think like yeah now like you'd walk around the gym and like 
people are there for all different reasons. People are there to climb hard. People are there to train for AA. People are there to, to just come for a birthday party. People are there just to knock around for the evening. They're on a date or they're just there after work. They use it as a supplement for their other training. Maybe like you get a lot of people who are into like tough mudders and stuff. You get a lot of that crew and the CrossFit kind of people come mm. in. So you get so many different walks of life. And I think that's one of the cool things uh, for the community, especially is like, we always had quite a tight-knit community. I remember when I started, like people would always talk to you like yeah. I climbed a lot during the day when I first started so like there was less people but you would always just get talking to people and even now you still do I think it's a little bit trickier maybe because there's more people Yeah. so like you can't talk to everyone I think there was like this kind of thing at Mile End especially where like a new person would start and like the regulars would see and then they'd be, like sort of take you under their wing a little bit and like teach you the ethics of climbing which I think is something that, that gets lo- lost a little bit um and let's talk give, about that what, the what, ethics of climbing yeah. yeah I guess like just even like indoor climbing like ethics like Shit like, oh, just like not walking underneath people and standing on the people, just stuff like that. Like uh, the unofficial queuing system, like you kind of all look around and everyone kind of knows like, I'm going to have a go and you're going to have a go. Like th- people just don't get that. And I think it's hard to, without having to talk to people, like the staff having to like give tours and shit or like watch a 10 minute video, which no one wants to do. Like that's something that's like peer to peer talk. And I think yeah. we, we don't lose it, but it's definitely harder because you can't talk to everyone. Yeah. So definitely. I think like the... And then obviously that leads to the outdoor ethics as well, which is different because obviously indoor, goddamn, no one cleans their holes anymore. Like everything's dirty all the time because no one brushes. And obviously that worries me because outdoors, it has more of a detrimental effect on the rock. So uh, I look at places like Fontainebleau and Albaris Finn, like they, they struggle sometimes with the amount of volume of people they get and the quality of the rock um, and people climbing at the wrong times of year. Even in the UK, like Southern Sandstone, they've had to like shut that a bunch of times because it's just getting smashed up. Like Really? Yeah, like people just don't realise that you can't climb sandstone. Like, even if it's re- if it rains one day and then you have two nice days of like okay weather, you've got to have like serious heat and wind for that sandstone to dry in particular. Mm. So people don't get this stuff and then they're just like, oh, well, you just don't want us to climb. It's like, no, we want people to be able to climb this for more than just like a few more years. Like, so I think some of that does get lost and it's something that comes up with like, should indoor walls teach people about the outdoors? And I think certainly they should. Like your customers are also representing you as a business. If they go outdoors and like, if I went outdoors and people were doing some dumb shit and they were like, oh yeah, we climb it like so-and-so. But like, oh, that place is like, <laughs> let be, like aren't really doing much for their community. So I think everywhere has, a, everyone has a bit to do. And obviously the BMC, which is a, the British Mountaineering Council, um, they, they always have like campaigns on about like respect the rock and about hill walking and stuff because they cover that aspect. So I think there is stuff out there, but there's just so many people now, mm-hmm. which is great. Like, I think it is great in one sense, like, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot. So would you say that climbing is, or is either in the process or already has evolved from the stage where it's kind of like hardcore Definitely. lifestyle guys yeah. who are climbing to yeah. like your kind of mom and dad going totally. climbing on the like, weekend? You can walk into my land on most days and there's like a member of the British team training like smashing around and then you've got someone it's their first ever time they don't know what a hold is they don't know what like a vb is they don't know what anything is so i think it's kind of beautiful that you can have like such a varied thing like you're not walking into a gym and it's like oh shit like everyone here is like a crusher like everyone here is like trying hard like you can go and you can do that like at most walls or you can go there and have a fun time i think Fair. and that's what root setting uh for me like it, it we look at most places now it's like on a commercial side it's got to be inclusive but for everyone mm-hmm. so for us like the 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 v1 to three grade range which we'll sort of get into is like the most important because those low grades everyone's going to climb if it's your first time or if you're like a v11 climber you're probably going to climb v1 to three to either walmart or it's your project so like you really have to look at the inclusivity of of everything for everyone like we're not just got yeah we've not just got those customers now who are climbing hard or want this specific thing we've got to cater for a lot of people and and then also obviously like there's different trends within route setting as well so like you've kind of got to keep on board with those a little bit because people see stuff on instagram now and they're like oh we want to try that and then like you've got to try and sort of keep on board with what's happening and and then the competitions affect us as well because people will see stuff in the comps and they're like wow that's awesome and then then they might see it on the comp like the next week. So so yeah, yeah. you kind of got to keep on board with things. Mm. And it's, things are happening so quick. There's a lot going on. Like new holds, goddamn, there's holds like every day. Like kilter, you have to stop. There's just it's like there's too many holes that we can't buy. Like where are we gonna put them all? 
Really? Uh, this, but the, not in a bad way. Like, and never cussing, like a, never cussing um, those guys. They just, they, they just, I don't know how Ian does it, man. He just builds, he creates so many amazing holes. Just all that, like, where does this come from? Like, and then like, like you a, think you've seen it and then he's something, he brings something else out and you're like, oh, that's so sick. Like, uh, but all the holes companies are doing well at the moment. Like, it's nice to see that through lockdown and stuff, they've, they've, they've carried on and they've done well. And like, they've, they've had business going because of the home walls and stuff. But also just like seeing new people shaping and like bringing in younger people who are like who are still like competing and stuff. And I'm excited to see what some of the companies are bringing out. Like for sure, definitely, it's definitely a thing for us as setters. Like new holds gives us new creativity. I think like not that like you run out, but like that is always a nice thing. Like you go in somewhere and there's like some new shapes you've not tried, or like people come to the wall and they see shapes that are in World Cups, so it's kind of like a bit of a selling point as well, and like a bit of a magpie effect, but we've got these enormous, they're called like the shields from Morpho, and they kind of do look like shields, like a medieval shield, Yeah. and they're big and red and white, and like, they're enormous, so when you're walking through the centre and you see those, you're like, I want to climb that, I yeah. don't know what the hell it is, it looks cool, so we do get some of that sort of stuff, like the visual side of setting is definitely, a, like the aesthetic side of setting is a massive thing, especially if you look at the World Cup, generally the semis and the finals, you'll see like, much more like the actual holds on the wall is like artistic yeah i was i wanted to say uh, two things aren't the um, for for the big competitions are holds also custom made or what would mm, they not really sometimes they'll get stuff that's new that no one's even seen like generally the first world cup boulder world cup will be like all the two of the guys who set they have two of the whole companies so generally you'll see like loads of cheetah loads of flat hold and they'll almost use it to showcase their mm. new grips. But it also means for the athletes, they don't know the holes. That's so good, it right? adds like a way better dimension because like even I know like, when I walk around my land, I know all the holes. Yeah. Like because I wash them, I set with them, I play with them, I climb with them. So I know like if I'm in a weird position that's like feels low percentage, I can throw myself with that hold. Wait, 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 it feels low percentage. Like I'm like unstable or oh, like okay. I'm not like, <laughs> oh, I might fall off this, but I know oh, if I just do a move up to that, I'll be okay. Mm. Like I sadly sometimes it hinders you because like yeah. you get so sucked into knowing all the grips so i think it's good for the athletes especially to try some new stuff and it's kind of cool at the beginning of the season when the the root setters and everyone else and the other athletes don't know how each other are doing and then they get thrown into almost like a, a blind contest because not only do they not know what the boulder problem is they don't really know the holes as well right. so i think it adds a better yeah an surprise. extra layer of yeah complexity. yeah for sure for sure whereas like if they whipped out like not that the old holds are bad, like they're still absolutely amazing, but like they know that like, okay, I can hold that like from that position on that angle because that's what they train like all year round to do. They just basically mm -hmm. like climb as much as possible with different holes, different angles, different shapes, like they obviously different setters, different sequences so they can just like be as well-rounded as possible. And then like we saw that Merignan World Cup when they put the crack on and the Japanese team got annihilated mm -hmm. because as, as great as they are, they are, well, I say great, they're fantastic at all the coordination and the jumping and stuff they couldn't crack climb right and it showed a huge weakness in their game mm. or in a lot of people's game and obviously Andre pissed up, up it which which he mm. should have which he did so that was cool to see like something like that even though that's not a new hold it's actually one of the oldest techniques in, yeah. in theory because people can be climbing cracks forever you don't see it as much in comps mm. you do now from that was a bit of a turning point mm. like, there's a crack on the comp on my land right wait what Oh, is it is it like new or yeah? We just uh, like Rob, Rob Napier um, came down for a couple of days and set with us. Uh, he's he's one of the, like the GB national setters. He used mm -hmm. to set World Cups and stuff. He's a super nice guy. First time I worked with him, um, incredibly talented as well. And he, he shapes holds. He's got a company called Enigma. Um, it's a good name for a, a great name actually. Yeah, name for yeah, it's a good name for a whole company. Yeah, a a whole company. <laughs> um, and then he also shapes for other companies. I didn't realize like the shaping side of things like in the hold world you don't really hear about it like it's very i understand that a lot of it is very hush hush because it's like quite competitive and obviously like they don't want to give away any secrets but like even if they just put on the instagram post like hey new shapes from this person i'd be psyched i'd be like oh sick like that person designed these like so yeah when he was like oh you just front out all these names of all these things he's been doing i was like dude like you're awesome like how did you do all these things like i had so many questions like when i meet new setters I, like especially when i started setting i had like a 21 question sort of thing uh, for the same things and i haven't done it in so long i forgot what to ask him but like i've just had other things because like i haven't met many people who shape like that like a friend of mine shapes has a company called hardwood holds shout out to alex fry and will um they've got a great wooden hold company but 
obviously not that it doesn't take skill it's fucking ridiculous to think how the hell they make the same hold over and over again perfect like I just sat with them yesterday on a friend's board and like you pick up three pinches and they're all exactly the same and I was like I couldn't do this sculpting mm. hurts my brain mm. so when I see it because when they're sculpting the plastic holds they do it all from foam mm-hmm. and then they make a mould from the foam and then they, that's their last and then they right. fill it with that and I'm just like how do they do this and they're using like all these little s- different tools and scrapers and sanders and whatever yeah. and it just I find it so incredible even when you look at the most simplest looking holds there's these micro details like especially on anything with dual texture where like they'll have one part you can hold and one part you can't like wait how does that work oh like is so it's one like bit smooth, smooth and one bit's rough yeah so like you can only hold the rough bit right so it, it, it forces like a, mo- a lot more like accuracy um and then like if you touch sometimes even if, if like, a part of your hand touches the dual tech it almost feels like you start sweating more and it's like, slippery yeah. so it's just like it's really cool and you can see like the little details between different people's holes mm-hmm. like where they like the dual tech start and end like on some of the blue pill volumes i used the other day like it starts quite early so like you can't hold a lot of it mm-hmm. like you could on some of the other ones so there's all these little nuances and I, th- and I think that that's really what sets them apart and like makes it so interesting you could use like the same shape volume like wooden volume like big triangle from one company that could be just slightly different to another one because they might use a different texturing process or a different this or a different that and I think yeah it gives us a lot of options and it makes yeah. things fun for us yeah no it's, it's, I'm, I'm, it sounds like it's a world on its own yeah um, the, 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 how you shape oh, yeah. holds dude that's like a whole other podcast that you would have to do I think. <laughs> but one thing that I was curious about is how do you actually become a route setter yeah I know we went a little bit off, off that so yeah so I started at the wall I got my foot in the door, door with a setting team there and, and kind of went from there and I did like a I've been doing like an unofficial, I guess, like trainee scheme slash apprenticeship that they were, they were sort of trialing as like a, as a bit of a guinea pig to see whether we could make, because there's no real governing body. We haven't got a union. We haven't got like anything like that. There's no official long-term training. We do have now um, more and more centers, obviously, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, which means obviously more opportunities to get into root setting. Um, if they have a good in-house team and they have a head setter, the problem is the more balls that open, there's not enough headsets like people in charge of the same um in terms of like to to run the day-to-day um not so much the admin side but definitely like the training side like they like to bring new people in you want them trained well so what's the structure of of a route setting team let's say in my land at my land at the moment uh we have uh alex lamel who's our our route setting chief like our manager he's like both the manager and the headset some places will have a route setting manager who just deals with like the admin side of things and the booking and the logistics and then they'll also have a headset who's on the set like the art side of things yeah like like the the chief will be on the set making sure the grades are on point and that like the day-to-day is getting done like actually on the set whereas alex does both so that's kind of a bit different to lots of places but it still works uh, and then there's two of us there's there's me uh, and there's jack uh, shout out to those guys um and, and me and jack are kind of like on the lo- like the end of a trainee sort of phase like we've just been part passed off so we're kind of moving into being like full-time setters so a bit more responsibility um uh and and yeah what, what, what is your responsibility as a as a route setter like in in your um in your current role and what was it before so through the whole trainee thing we went through different like levels almost so it was like you start at the beginning and like you're like you're like i knew nothing about mm-hmm. setting. Like, i didn't know how, like i could use an impact driver like i didn't really understand I didn't even know like what the different types of bolts were. There's two different types of bolts. Like they kept saying, "I'll oh, get me a six mil bolt." So I was measuring fucking bolts to see how long they were. But it's not about that. It's about how thick they are, like and right. stuff like that. So I knew like nothing about like mm-hmm. about these things. Um, I didn't know even know what the material was. They were like, "I'll oh, get me some PE," and I was like, "What the hell is what's PE?" And it's like polyester is the one of the types of materials they use for the holes or polyurethane. Mm-hmm. So I knew nothing. So I had to learn like everything. I didn't really also know how to climb very well. I was just strong. So I came from martial arts background, yeah. so I came in. So I was okay at climbing, but I was strong, which was like, it's not always that great. Like, but I also wasn't strong in the right senses. And obviously as you go through the phases that like, you learn from like setting ladders, like VBs, like the easiest ones, like you just start from that. And you So that's where you start yeah. from when it comes to round yeah. setting You start from the bottom and work your way up. Okay. So the, like, the first year was kind of like getting from V1 to V4, like kind of getting that all under wraps. And then the second phase was like, doing the more moderate grades and then getting into the rope setting because obviously at mile end we're not just bouldering we do have ropes 
Um, and obviously that brings in a whole other aspect of things. And then the third level was kind of moving into the more competition stuff and the harder grades. And that's where I've kind of just finished up. So, so now like my day to day is like a full set. Like mm -hmm. I get onto the set, we strip, we set like, yeah, that's kind of it. Whereas before it, it could be like, you'll strip the wall with the, the, with the team and then you go outside and you're washing holds. So I've like washed holds in the fucking snow. I've washed, <laughs> I've washed them, like I've defrosted the jet washer before when it's been so cold because diesel doesn't quite freeze. It just goes like into a gel. Um, I've done it in the baking sun. Like, yeah, like I've stripped the entire lead wall now. Like it's funny, me and Jack were washing on Friday and we, were, man, we probably did like 30, 35 buckets probably I reckon, like something like that. No, maybe not that many, maybe like 30 buckets. It was like quite a lot. But like, I Why do you need to wash them? Is it just hygiene? Or? So the, the holes will stay on the wall like between four to eight weeks, some places maybe even longer. And obviously the more you climb on them, the more chalk and residue and, and even the, the shoe rubber as well gets over yeah. the holes. And much like if you think about skin, like it's porous. So they have a texture to them. So some yeah. of them are textured to feel like specific rock types. Some are just textured so you can grip them. And obviously the more you climb them, the more that gets filled up. And if people don't brush them, and even if they do brush them, they still get dirty. And visually, they look gross. Like after yeah. a while, it's nice to, to give them a wash and clean them up yeah. and get them fresh. And obviously, they will just go back on the wall and get dirty again. So you don't have to polish them or anything, but it's nice to, to have everything fresh. That makes perfect sense. So let's uh, stop on the kind of, I would say, the variety of, of climbing. Um, routes that you can get so first you you've, you've already explained what a ladder is the easiest yeah. kind of kind of climbing and then you said that the a little bit more advanced like up to v4 what are the challenges for a route setter in setting up those routes so going through the the, the grades really is just is it can be like different depending on where you are like some places you'll notice like the easier grades will just be like holds further apart or like maybe a bit more powerful or maybe the holes are just a bit worse and that's quite basic and that's fine, like it can cater to people and sometimes that's what you do at the beginning because you just are learning. But now I've got to the point where like, I think the, the lower grades are super important because they teach people so much. Like they get the most traffic. Like I said, some people are gonna climb those as their warm ups, as their projects um, and everything in between. And I think that V1 to three, V to four grade is really important because um, it's like, it's gonna be the most climbing stuff in the center. What are the, what are the you know, things that you can offer kind of on, on the wall to people who are gonna climb. Just making things interesting, giving them like variety. Like there's three of us in house setting and we bring in guest setters as well. And uh, the three of us are similar in a lot of ways, but also very different in ways as well of our styles. And I think the more you work with each other, the more you, you can just like take a step back and like look at something they're setting and be like, okay, like they're going like with something technical and balancey. Okay, maybe I'll do something that's a bit like more funky and like, dynamic or something so like you don't want to go onto a set and every block feels the same right oh this one's got a like uh, uh, like a, a toe hook release like every block's got the same move or something like or everything feels very similar or, or it feels the same as the last set that was on that same area so say you're on like a slab which is something where it generally is quite balancing and technical you're leaning into the wall it's on an incline um or a decline which way is it I would say it's like a decline. Decline, yeah, yeah. Because it's not overhanging, basically. Like, yeah. you're, like you've got to lean into the wall, which means you're trusting your legs a little bit more. So stuff like that, you don't want to get onto, like do a set and then the customers are like, oh, it feels like the last set. Like that's the last thing you want to hear. From, mm -hmm. like, in, my, in my opinion, like you want it to be like, oh shit, like the last set was amazing. Like how did you make it better? Like I like it when you hear that, like not even on my own sets, but when you go somewhere and someone was like, oh yeah, like this set was really good. And then they did another set and it was even better. Like I like to hear customers get excited about the setting because we work really hard, I think, and it's a really hard thing to do uh, in reality. Um, and you get a lot of shit from people as well. Really? Oh my God, yeah, no, dude. I've been shouting really? so much. For what? Fucking everything. Jesus Christ. Yeah, like, I'll be, especially as, as like The Apprentice, like, you get, you're on the ground. Like, you're the walking comments book. God, yeah, like my first set I did, and I washed all the grips, and then my boss had left me like open lines so it was a bit simpler so i didn't get too like caught up with trying to make too many crazy moves and i asked his customers Wait, you, open lines what so like he, he we had a wall that was quite wide but short so he'd set stuff and like he'd set a route and then leave a bit of space and then set another one and leave a bit of space oh, so, so it was almost like yeah so i just it was like okay i've got this little like passage almost follow this line and I went to one of the customers afterwards who I didn't massively like anyway. I was like, oh, what do you think? And he was, oh, well, these ones are all a bit straight line. They're a bit shit. And I was like, it's that first set. Like, 
two months into setting and like I was really happy with what I'd done. And they obviously they were probably pretty shit in one aspect, but it wasn't constructive. I don't if you want to shit on me, I don't mind as long as it's constructive. Like yeah. if you come up to me and like, oh, I didn't like this route, this didn't really feel good, the clipping position wasn't good, or like the foothold should have like didn't feel right. Like I want that knowledge. I want that and I keep a journal of lots of these things as well. Like because I find it better to write down and like even after my sets now I write down a list of all the stuff that I set and obviously we normally set to a grade and if I made that grade or not or whether it was harder or easier and if I needed to tweak anything and stuff like that so yeah like i try and like get as much feedback as possible Fair. because and especially because there's not like not only is there people at the climbing walls um who are good climbers like in the in my, in my eyes of like who climb a lot who have good knowledge i speak to people who who are new as well i'm like oh did you where did you struggle with that or like why did you do this did, like maybe give them some more insights well like, a lot of time we end up almost coaching people because mm. route setting basically is coaching people how to climb but without right. actually having to talk to them yeah like people yeah. have like when you ask me like what is route setting like some of my friends will have like really like articulated answers of like oh it's like a an interactive immersive like construction or like sculpture almost and it is like but i'm not that artsy sometimes but i do respect that still but like yeah people can get really stuck in with these things and it teaches them a lot like and i think that's cool to see someone new start and then watch their progression climbing through not just your own boulders but through the team's boulders and seeing them get better and stuff and i like that yeah i was also thinking how accurate is grading oh god this is a whole other podcast grading is so subjective because when when you know when you have a when you have a two routes they will both be like let's say v4 but like are they really what, what what's your take on that it's tough it's really tough you've got to, like i think one of the first things to remember is like when we're setting we we set and we test like we climb everything before we let the public climb on it like mm -hmm. it, so it's basically like a proof that it works and it's safe and that it, it it does the job and in that time obviously we will hope that it's the grade that we expected it to be and if it's not we either make it easier or we make it harder sometimes we leave it if it's a really good route and this is a problem sometimes is that like we'll be like oh it was meant to be v4 but it's actually v5 but it's really good so we'll leave it but then we look at like my boss looks at the grand scheme of the entire center like if like we know at the moment that some of the yellows are a bit too spicy or a bit too hard or on the top end so we know that on the next couple sets we've got to make sure that they cater for like the grade range that they're in because we use a grade range each color has a range yep. rather than a singular grade having a singular grade i think puts a bet a more of a target on on the on the on the number because if you if you're saying this is v4 through the whole center and then you climb them all and they feel all totally different like even if it's like your style or it's not it's hard to to do and also a lot of people don't climb outdoors and obviously grading most of the time comes from outdoors because that's where you get your consent consensus right if you go into like uk climbing you type in uh stanage and you go look at brad pitt it's a classic 7c 7c because that's what the majority have voted on basically mm -hmm. and when i went to albaris inn i was crapping myself because i was getting on blocks and the original guidebook would say like 8a for one boulder and then the new guidebook says 7b plus because over yeah. the years it's been downgraded yeah so you yeah, have to look at these definitely. things and i think for setters most of the time like obviously you can still like i haven't done tons and tons outdoors compared to most of my, my colleagues and most of the people around but like you climb enough to know like i've climbed like they'll be like i've been to font and i've climbed like 100 v4s yeah so like they get an idea what a v4 feels like yeah that's what that that's that that's that's how i thought it it must be working i was also thinking um because what, what's your take? What there is, is it better to have a range? So oh, those routes are V3 to V5? Or, yeah, or do I like you think more. it's better to have like a single number? Yeah. No, I like the circuits because the circuits come from Fontainebleau. Like that's where it all came from. And then the climbing works in Sheffield sort of adopted it first to my knowledge. And then it sort of trickled around to the rest. I like it. It means that like there's no specific, like one, everything overlaps. So it goes like zero to one one to two, one to three, two to three, two to four, and so on and so forth, yeah. all the way up to V8 plus, which is like the hardest circuit. So it means that like, as you get into like the V1 to three circuit, you can sort of do some of the next circuit, but not all of them, but yeah. you can kind of, you, you're creeping through it. So you get a nice flow of progression. I think that's the main thing. And also it saves our butt a little bit that if like, oh, I was meant to set V4, but it's actually V5 and it's a three to five circuit, it's still within that circuit. So you can kind of, 
yeah. it, it, it's not lost. Sometimes things slip, don't get us wrong. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say that like, sometimes things can't be a little bit sandbagged, but we don't generally do it on purpose. We're not going to be like, oh, let's set like a V4 for this V1 to free circuit. Oh, no, sorry, like a V6 for this V1 to free circuit. Like, sometimes there are hard ones, but they're also hard because like v3 outdoors especially like can be super technical so and people might not see like things as obviously like we often look in route setting especially with the competition side of things on a, a scale of like risk complexity intensity so mm-hmm. our, 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 our rci ric scale and that came from this guy called tonde who's like a pretty big figure in route setting uh, in the united states and in, in the industry so that sometimes it might be like oh the holes are really good and like like it's not a hard grade but it's really complex and sometimes we don't do that in the easier grades because it can be a bit frustrating for people. So I think a lot of the easier grades is like, we always like to try and cover like specific techniques as well. Like giving them something that's going to add more to their to their arsenal. Like I feel like the best climber is the one who knows like the most stuff. Like going back to the crack climbing in the, in the comps, like Andre won that because he knew all of this climbing skills. It's not a, it is a, I guess a niche thing for a lot of people, but for the bricks especially, we should all be good at cracks yeah. because we have a history of crack climbing. Yeah, and I know a lot of the like guys and girls on the British team are pr- pretty nifty when they need to be. So, yeah, I think yeah for us like c- covering all of our bases on grades and then like making sure of different styles as well is really important. And that's why like when you're a setter, when you climb in your personal time, you don't have that luxury of like oh I don't like slabs, so I won't climb a slab. Like I have to be proficient on a slab because I set on slabs. And even though I'm not the best slab climber, I like setting on a slab one of the most actually because you have to really you can really force people to climb and move yeah well actually let's talk about that let's talk about styles what can can you give me the or like not only me the, the listeners the overview of different like kind of styles and yeah. how do you do the, the route setting so based like, on di- that? Di- different styles like generally starts with what angle of wall you're on so obviously vertical is vertical um then you have like, we were talking about slabs, which is like the d- d- decline, so you're leaning inwards more, and then you have overhanging stuff, which is where you're leaning backwards more. And obviously stuff can go from, from completely vertical to, I would say, I don't really know if there's many places in London that go past like 60, 70 degrees on some of their walls, but like in my land, we do have like parts where you can climb a full flat 90 degree, like yeah. your, ba- your back is parallel with the floor, yeah. like in the monkey house, and that's something that not a lot of places have, and I, I, really, I really enjoy that style of climbing. Um, people think it's all about strength but it's, there's a lot of technique yeah. and then the day to day of like actual the setting process um, we set by area some places still set by circuit so they'll do like the greens in the whole centre in over a day or two or something like that mm-hmm. whereas like we pick an area so for instance we'll be doing the cave so today on the cave we'll strip it in the morning uh, and then we start generally with volumes and so volumes can be anything from like a small uh, triangle made from like plywood or whatever wood they use and it's textured with sand and paint so it's like grippy and basically when you put that onto any cam like what i say is like the wall is your canvas and then like the volumes will be like your like first layer Mm -hmm. i look at things in root setting like i do in photoshop with layers Mm -hmm. so i I reference that quite a bit i think and like so that'll be your first layer so it'd be like quite low on the bottom and basically that dictates uh, on a commercial set especially like we use volumes for any problems so you've got to think okay i'm setting uh from the top we always start with the hardest boulder normally like the normal hardest one so the pinks and the oranges are v6 and then oh v- that's how you v6 start setting paper. yeah we start with the hardest ones first ah. so that i think that's what most people do that's how definitely how most of the places i know deal with it so it goes volumes some places again don't have any volumes like everyone's different depending on what they have in stock and what they have in their cupboard um some places strip the day before and wash uh, sometimes we wash in the morning when we strip it some places strip and wash and put it straight back on the wall if they don't have like lots of rotation of grips um, we're really fortunate at mile end that obviously been open for so long and also that Al has a bit of an obsession with holds and he likes to always get interesting things and different stuff and we've got boxes and boxes and boxes of holds from over the years we can switch and swap things out quite uh, quite easily so um, we don't have to always put stuff on the same same again which is quite nice so oh yeah actually that's so interesting what you just touched upon what's the so let's say you have the, the blue range of holds and the green range of holds and you know yellow range of holds the holds in each segment are gonna be different yeah okay what what will be the dif- differentiating um, criteria there's, there's a so for obviously for the lower grades you'll generally find like for the the, the ba- most basic ones are just like jugs so jugs imagine if you've got um 
a jug handle. Yeah. Imagine just like that. You can put your whole hand in it. Like it's like a huge, like bowl almost. Like any basically anyone should be able to walk off the street and climb a VB in mm-hmm. in most gyms, like in most centers. That's like the sort of standard requirement for it. And they also use them as down climbs. So especially on a slab, if you climb up something that's like tiny little horrible holds and you struggle to get up there, then you know you've got something to down climb from. Or if you're stuck at any point and you have a freak out, you can know there's going to be like black and yellows or like pinks in one place in another center. You know that like they have a down climb section basically. Yeah. And that's really good to have, um, especially on a commercial basis. And sometimes we have a bit of a wobble, so it's nice to have something to get down from. And then as the, the grades go up, the holds will change different shapes, different sizes. Um, we have some circuits that have more uh, slopers and pinches in and some that have more crimps and pockets in and then we have some that just have everything that's why I think personally like the purples and the yellows even though they're the same brand and they have basically the same sets of holes Axis make like some absolutely beautiful classic simple shapes that just cater for everyone so mm-hmm. um, what's your favorite set on uh, at Myland when it comes to holes if you're saying yeah I'm saying like pur- purple probably because or, or, or the yellows because they're the same They've, they, they're basically the same, but like there's a few more in the yellows than there is in the purples, and there's a few in the purples that they don't have in the yellows. Mm-hmm. But I think they just cover all bases. There's mm-hmm. like bad crimps, there's good like slots, there's nice slopers. That, like the Axis eggs are like legendary. Everyone loves and hates them because they're so good but so frustrating. Um, Which ones? They're like the eggs. Have you seen them? They're like they're like a plate, and then they've got like a bit of a dimple. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're the yeah, stuff at my end. Those are rough. They're like obviously the ones at my end are quite old, so they're not quite as like textured as well. Mm-hmm. But it makes you have to be strong on them. Like That's not true. so much strong, but precise as well. Like you can't just be faffing around on it. You've got to like. Climb, you've got to be able to climb on those things. That's, that's Sorry, I'm so doing cool. hand movements and we've not got any video. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, like I love the blues because I love the the shapes from kilter and stuff. But I think as like a universal, like in our in our circuits, I think that is probably one of the mm-hmm. the, the blues. The, the, sorry, the the purples and the yellows. Yeah, that you've got the most, almost the most variety in shapes and stuff. Like that, that makes that makes perfect sense. What's where is the the art of route setting and and indoor climbing evolving, which direction is it going towards in your opinion? It's definitely, yeah, it's definitely heading in the direction of like more inclusive, like more accessible, um, com- like compy stuff has become more influxed within the commercial set. So you'll see like more complex movement and like, uh, what's the word? Coordination, mm-hmm. coordination is a big one, and and people always think, oh, but you wouldn't find that outdoors, and it's like no, like all these moves came from the outdoors or inspired from. Okay, some of it was inspired from like parkour and things like that, and gym more gymnastic styles of things. But for the most part, like when someone's like, oh, you wouldn't find a double clutch outside, and I'm like, fuck no, like there are in front like cannonball seven B Bascuvia, that's a double clutch, or like. Uh, what was the one wing tiger v11 yosemite there's a paddle in that you don't have to do the paddle but you can because it looks more gangster as well mm-hmm. so like you will find these moves outdoors piff path in front again bascuvia funny what's enough. piff path it's just a boulder you have to do like a big undercut and then you do like a bit of a double dyno oh, so like you have to like fully release and then catch two different holds with oh, each God. one with each hand and like people see that indoors and like it's a great name isn't it <laughs> um, and people see that indoors and go oh you wouldn't find that outdoors but you would and I think yeah, especially now with like the, the comp scene getting so big and so like, and so much better because comps were awful for a long time. The whole thing with comps, like with, with this was before my time of climbing was like, it basically got to a point of like, who was the strongest on the shittest little ratty, horrible mm-hmm. edges. Imagine just trying to hold like your body weight on credit cards, like and yeah. your bad feet and your steep. Now it's like, change the game it would i think if lots of people say to me if like if it wasn't what it is now like the style of setting and stuff and the holds it wouldn't be in the olympics because it wasn't entertaining yeah now it is because it's like it doesn't matter how strong like obviously the team the the national competitors are ridiculously strong like you watch them come to the wall and you're like what on earth and then like not to shit on them but then like those guys and girls make semis and you're like well if they're that good and they make semis how good are the finalists mm-hmm. like and I got I was lucky enough to compete uh, a couple of years ago just be- or last year just before lockdown in, in, in Germany a place called Studio Block um, and I got to see Yanya Garnbrandt who's like the GOAT like, yeah. she's not the GOAT she's the GOAT she's the greatest of all time mm-hmm. like for competition climbing she's, she's, grand, she's Grand Slam champ she's done everything like she's murked it and I saw her light climb live and I was like she's not real 
It's like she's a robot or something. She's she's on. There is no first place. There's Yanya, and then there's like first, second place is first place for mm-hmm. the most part. Like she dominates so much, and watching them all climb was insane. Is it is 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 it? Would you say? Is she kind of like Adamondra, or is she like for comp stuff? Yeah, no, but 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 like in terms of comp stuff, she's better than Andra because he's uh, he has won World Cups. So I don't think he's won a season to my knowledge, but like, and he got to the Olympics. But she won. She did like a clean sweep of like Boulder and Lead one season. I'm pretty sure it was, mm-hmm. and then she won the Olympics. So she's done like she's just so good. She's it's, phenomenal. It's, is he better in outdoors climbing? Yeah. then? yeah. Uh, he's okay. well, if you look at his resume, he would be the goat because. He has bouldered like, I don't know, he's probably bouldered like V15, he's done 9C, he's done, he almost on site the whole of the Salafé wall on in Yosemite. So like what Alec, like the wall that Alex Honnold did in free solo, like El Cap, he did a different route. He got to the bottom, he didn't know any of the holds or anything he needed to do. He started at the bottom basically blindly and just climbed up until he fell off. And he wasn't far from the end. And like, even though people are, well, he didn't do the Salafé wall, it's like, yeah, but no one else is probably going to be able to do that feat like for a while and he got pretty close to doing it and if he had a pit better the weather conditions he probably would have done it mm. but then he's done like some of the hardest crack problems like first second go like i think he did a berry is it a belly full of blackberries like in utah i think it is and it's like some ridiculous inverted off with crack thing he did like second go mm. and all the crack climbers are like but this is a guy who's doing boulder lead speed multi-pitch like sport and trad he's doing big walling he does everything i think as an all-rounded like there are people who obviously climb harder in single disciplines like he's probably not going to climb v17 at any t- time soon to my knowledge because he's like not training for that he probably fucking could though knowing him because he's such he's such a ridiculous athlete but he's just done high levels of everything mm, like, he's well-rounded oh so well-rounded actually when it comes to training you know as amateurs what is as a route setter you have this kind of interesting backdoor insight what's what do how do you think people should be should be climbing to 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 essentially just get better not get hurt at the same time as well i feel like when people start their climbing journey now like i tell people like there's so much emphasis on training and like there's so much out there now especially through lockdown like the guys at lattice have done a big job like pushing training plans and getting information out there not just for like a business side of things but because they want to educate people well on how to train and how to stay fit and healthy. And there's so many coaches and stuff there now. I feel like when you're getting into climbing the first couple of years, just climb. Yeah. Don't be chasing numbers. Don't try doing loads of hard stuff. You don't need to campus or get onto the board, like onto a training board or anything like that. Just climb. Learn how to move. Because also your, your tendons and your pulleys and stuff and your body needs to condition to it. And there's nothing else that any of us can think of uh, someone can prove me wrong there's nothing else that will prepare your fingers for climbing like climbing yeah like the best some of the best people for crossovers uh gymnasts dancers break dancers especially uh yoga guys are good yoga good flexibility martial artists where you have body awareness and you know like if like i like i always break things down into weightlifting terms like when people are like doing stuff and i'm like well what's the e like a common thing is that people climb with their arms bent like a T-Rex yeah. and I say to them what's the easiest part of a push-up you're, when your arms are straight it's the easiest bit right it's the going down and going up is the hard bit that's where you're using your muscles so why would you climb with your arms bent all the time engaging your muscles and they're like oh that makes sense so it's nice that you can break it down and, and when you see new people as well who might not understand climbing terminology you can reference other stuff because it crosses over You, I came from martial arts and I always still use certain movements and stuff I break it down into jujitsu in my mind because of like the way you move the positioning like and I break down the movements like we would in the stages because in jujitsu it's all about position before submission um if you try and just like grab someone's arm and and lock it up most likely it's not going to work you've there's there's five or six stages prior to that and I try and do that with my climbing and how I break it down for people Mm -hmm. as well so into the into small bits and I would say yeah like people just need to just like enjoy climbing as well like climb all different styles like guys generally come in they're strong they might have done a different sport they might just be a gym guy they're pretty like in good shape they can do like big dynamic moves and they really enjoy it because it's confidence boosting and it's fun but generally what happens they might get hurt easier because they're trying stuff out their league and they're not conditioned for because they might be able to bench like 90 100 kilos in the gym but your shoulders aren't ready for being separated by like two holds sort of thing like taking that tension is different 
Um, whereas I see a lot of women come into the sport, uh, generally maybe less confident in their strength, but they learn to move better because they understand their body awareness. Um, and then they, like, as you should do, build strength over time. So it's kind of fun to see like women and guys, like couples especially, start at the same time mm. and see who gets better. Interesting. Really, that's really good, especially when you work at a wall, you see it a lot and it's kind of cool to see. And generally the women, after time, come out better because they're stronger. But generally, like sometimes I find that maybe if they're in a partner of a guy, that they're not as confident in their strength. Even though they are probably stronger than the guys as well because mm. they rely, like the guys make them rely on them too much. Mm. But this, that's the one thing I've seen is so many more and more women climbing now. Like, when I walk through the wall now, it's like 50-50 sometimes. Yeah. Like, it was never like that. And I think it's so good to have more women in, in, in climbing. And I think the big thing for it is that in, in, <clears throat> in outdoor standards and indoor standards, the women are just as good as the men. Like, women have climbed V15. Yeah. I don't think anyone's gone 16 yet off the top of my head. No, I'm I awful. I'm like all, uh, please apologise. I'm awful for remembering stuff, like stuff that I should remember. This is to the, all the followers. And people who are like, oh my God, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I always forget. <clears throat> my brain has only so much hard drive space. Fair and enough. like, there's loads of jujitsu shit in there that are like, is staying for some reason. And I can't always absorb new climbing stuff. Fair so like, enough. friends of mine can remember like, oh yeah, this route was bolted by this person in this year. And I'm just like, where is that? <laughs> like, yeah. Where in the world? Um, so yeah, no, I think like the, the level is definitely quite similar. So it's quite nice to see that like, when you look at the top levels, like women aren't far off from men. Yeah. Especially on a rope now, we've got multiple women doing like eight, nine B pluses, like nine B, nine B pluses. Like in the last couple of years, it's been like a com more common thing. And I think that's definitely like a booster for women as well. Yeah. And it's just becoming more inclusive. And I think through the lockdown, we've seen the inclusivity for the uh, underrepresented groups in society as well. Like where it be like, um, there's a guy called uh, James Rotimi who runs a thing called like Climb, Climb R with like an X, like Climb XR. And he's, he's, getting a lot of like not basically like non-white dudes into climbing which is really cool and then there's a lot, load of other like groups like that that are popping up everywhere that are bringing like more light into like the lgbtq plus community um i know yonder do a lot of stuff with, with, with that and same as um oh, i've lost the other one off my mind it just left me but there, there's there's loads of stuff like that coming around getting like, more pe people uh we have like really good para climbers in the uk mm -hmm. like we have a really good from like there's a guy called Jess Dufton who's like basically fully blind and he's a phenomenal outdoor climber as well for trad like he did the old man ahoy and he basically can't see shit no way so he's he, he calls it non-sighting because he just basically can't see so everything is an on-site which means he, he does he has no prior information of what he's doing and he, he like the old man ahoy is no joke like it's a season he's step. doing trad yeah no yeah so that means like for people who don't know trad is like where climbing started on a rope where basically like Oh, when shit. you're climbing, you have to place your own protection as you climb. There's no like, there's no safety. Like you, are, it's as safe as you make it. So like he has to place pieces of gear, like metal blocks basically into the rock to stop him from falling to the ground. And he's blind basically. And oh. there's an incredible podcast with him. I think it was on the Jam and Crap podcast with Niall Grimes. And I was blown away. Wow. And there's, yeah, there's definitely more emphasis on, on inclusivity. And I think that's something I want to look into more is how to make it more inclusive for people with disabilities. And I listened to one of your podcasts with the Italian girl who, who was blind. Was she blind in one eye? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that one. And that was really good. And I, was, and I, I do see uh, people with, with disabilities at the wall. And I, I wonder, like, do I talk to them about it? Like, is that weird? But I think I will because I'd like to know how we can make things better, like more inclusive for them. And I know for... Some walls for visually impaired people, if they're colorblind, for instance, obviously we run on a full color system of single colors, but they might have patterned holds and things like that. Or like the old school way of setting was like, you just put holds on any colors you wanted and you just put tape. And like you put tape on the sequences that you wanted. And then either it meant that you just took the tape off and moved it next time, or you like, basically it means that like, there's an infinite system of hot, like possibility of holds because you, you you don't have one color but also it looks a bit messy and nowadays people like to go for one color it's easier commercially for people to follow i think same as the grades like making it inclusive using a grading system that makes sense for someone walking off the street like we use the v grading system which is american it was started by john sherman what what the v stands for that's where i'm getting to so uh -huh. john sherman was the guy who started the v grading system and the, the, his nickname was vermin so the v stands for verm all right so you start a vb which is the easiest one you go verm one up to now is this a 17 but indoors most places in the uk probably don't have pass that like v10 maybe v11 yeah i was th i was thinking what do what do is there first of all is there a lot of people who climb like where would you say 
if if it's even possible to kind of like put it this way where does the kind of like beginner grades end where do the intermediate grades end and 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 what's what's after that yeah like v3 v4 is probably the end of the beginning grades and then you get into the what we call the moderates which is sort of like four to six maybe seven mm -hmm. and then like hard grades then i guess you break down into like six up to like nine or ten and then the elite grades really are like actually no the elite grades are like 12 and above now i think people are climbing people are commonly climbing now like obviously as time goes on like at the moment v17 is the pinnacle for us but in a few years time that will probably be like not a standard but more people will do it because it'd be more common to as like the newer generation of climbers who are just f so strong they're just so because they've got all the science now like you look at shauna coxie she came up through the ranks when there was no science in this sport it was just like climbing and now there's these young guys and girls who have got coaches and performance stuff and they're getting hooked up to computers and they've got all the data which is great and that's evolution obviously like we're, we're climbing's always been quite behind a lot of mainstream sports especially coming from fighting um i got really into the ufc when it was still early days like before it is now so i saw it progress and like get into the mainstream and it's kind of happened with climbing as well and obviously in fighting as well like the science of things has come into play a lot more like with like the weight cutting and the training and the recovery and stuff so it's kind of like we're getting to that point now right so yeah that that, that makes perfect sense so where like how far are we from the, the the outer limit is there even some such thing as outer limit when it comes to like the difficultiness of what can be of like is there something that isn't climbable essentially outdoors uh, that, that is like just not like a flat wall like this it's hard i think like for bouldering outdoors like when you get into the like basically into the top end grades you're everything's overhanging because that's yeah. the hardest style right like yeah we're at v17 there's what two confirmed v17s 9a boulders we've got sleepwalker sit that dan woods put up and uh gnarly did the I can't remember what they named it in the end. Fair. Well, I was also the thing in Finland that's in the middle of nowhere that they all tried and said was ridiculously crazy and hard. So, uh. um, yeah, I, I know all like most of those top end guys who were like pushing like eight C plus like V V sixteen and stuff like they all say like hint at having like nine A projects. It's just like getting. I think when you're at that level of climbing like a V seventeen boulder, everything has to be right. Like, that's why you see them with the little portable fans and they're, like, making stuff so that, the, like, the sun can't get onto the holds because, like, at that level, like, every tiny detail, micro-adjustment or, like, yeah, like every little percentage that you could have, you want. You want to have, like, your skin's got to be in good condition, you've got to be rested, like, you want the temperature to be right because it's, like, you're on the pinnacle of that thing. Like, you don't want to be, like, turning up with crappy skin and, like, sh holding your shoe expecting to climb V17. <laughs> like... It's, it's that elite, elite level. And I think those guys as well are like, they're the visionaries now for, for the new routing because places like, for instance, like Fontainebleau, like mm -hmm. you're not going to find many new problems there in reality because it's so well developed. But there's so many places in the world that no one's even probably been to. Like a friend of mine was in Mexico and he was like, there's just boulder fields after boulder fields after boulder fields that no one climbs on because there's no, there's no in like there's no community there for it yeah whereas like people people especially now i think from going indoors people don't really want to go on those kind of journeys to like develop somewhere because people's time is short and like that's why people when they go climb in the states oh where did you guys go oh we went to like california mm -hmm. because weather's good right yeah why are you gonna fly half across the world to go climb in like new england when the weather there is not guaranteed to be good yeah. Like, even though there's incredible climbing there because I was living there for a while and I wanted to climb there and, and the weather was never right because I was in there in the summer it was too hot but there's places there's amazing places yeah. like even in the that's why people don't come to the UK very often mm -hmm. you don't often see the, the big name people come to the UK for to do to repeat stuff because A I guess at the moment there's not really enough hard hard stuff for them to come to like we've got what 9B is the hardest sport route uh, rain shadow at Malham Cove um, I don't know if Andre's done it yet or whether he just had a go on it but there's not a massive influx of stuff for those people to come and do. Whereas like Spain, Spain is like mm. Serrana and Chile and places like that. And like they're putting up new routes and they've got these ultra new classics that they call them and stuff like these crazy new routes that, that people want to go and do um, and test themselves on in different test pieces. Whereas, um, yeah, people just kind of want to almost go and guarantee that they're going to go and climb some stuff. Like some people don't want to go out and put that graft in to scrub out a boulder that might not even work. 
Yeah. But, but that's why I admire someone like Jimmy Webb, for instance, like he's forever developing things. And then he's like, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to develop an area and not tell anyone. It's like, no, this is where it all is. Like, and then guidebooks get made and then more people go there. And there was a really good um, film in one of the real rocks, I think, about uh, Joe's Valley and in Utah and how oh, that, yeah. and, and I love that I thought it was so beautiful like the scraggy climbers and then the locals like united to build like to, to come together and I thought that oh, was so God. lovely and I think it's something I'd love to do at some point because root setting is like creating indoor boulders but I've always wanted to like put up a route yeah like on boulders outdoors I think bolting a line is scary because there's a lot more that goes into it and I'm not that great at sport climbing in comparison, but I'd love, I just have loads of cool names for boulders, like for roots. <laughs> I feel like I just got like, because I'd have like loads of martial arts based ones because they're like, because a lot of stuff transfers over. Like in jujitsu, we have hill hooks. Yeah. Like one of the deadliest moves because they can just annihilate your knee and your yeah. ankle. So it kind of cool that like, if there was something with a really cool hill hook, I'd have a name for it. I'm not going to say what because someone might steal it. So. Uh, but then I lost a cool bunch of names because there was like a crew of like savages and they disbanded and I was going to name a boulder after them, but they fucked up. So. Mm. Like, when you set up a route is it you plan it you, you sketch it somewhere no. or you show up you start putting goals but you will like rework yeah. it try hold on to this see if you can reach that so for the most part no uh, having a preconceived idea is not always the best thing because sometimes it doesn't work for the competition wall often I'll draw I have a book somewhere I'll draw like I'll like I normally keep it near me because normally at night like I'll just wake up and I'll just draw something like an idea like a movement or like I'll obviously sometimes draw out the holds that I want to use as well but sometimes you might turn up to the set that hold's not available mm. you went for a piss you come back someone's taken the hold you wanted like from the <laughs> cupboard just things like that so sometimes having your heart set too much on one is is not a good thing but literally for the most part we walk in we strip the wall and we just start setting mm -hmm. like I was saying to you earlier like if you've ever seen the Lego movie. And I'm 13, I've seen it. It's, it's, it's good. It's a great film. Yeah. It's a great film. Terrible it's... song. I hate that song, but I think everyone does. What, what, everything, everything is, is awesome. Perfect. Everything oh, yeah, is awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That got my nerves a little bit because because I worked on a summer camp and the kids sang it for the rest of the like the, the three weeks. It's intense. But that's the same principle. Is like becoming a master builder. Is like becoming a root set. It's kind of like that. Like for me at least, because I came in with no knowledge, like nothing. Like I didn't know anything. Whereas other people obviously come in different stages. Um, not just as a setter, but obviously I was quite inexperienced as a climber. So for me, I had to learn it all. And I remember one of the guys, Jake Mason, shout out to him as well. He of was course. like, he was like, oh yeah, like in like 14 months, like it would just click. And one day I just walked in and like, without even thinking, I just started doing the job. You entered the matrix. Yeah. He just, <laughs> I, I leveled up. They, it was like, it was that like Scientology. I got to OT3 and like, they let me in. Like, I, got, I got there. Like it was just, it just made sense. Like, because there's so much that goes into it because once you start laying the volumes on the wall, and someone sets one problem, you can't just set on that same section without taking into account like what your problem will do to their problem, what their problem will do to yours. So there's not just like, oh, we just put a few holes on the wall and hope for the best. Like there's a lot of like actual logistics that sometimes we don't even talk to each other to, to deal with it. We just like, we just know. Like, mm. and you get to that point as well. And, and often sometimes you do have to talk to each other and be like, hey, like guys, I'm just gonna put this here. Like, can you not use this bit of the volume because it's gonna be, for my problem so like you can put something below it like so it doesn't get in the way like and then sometimes if you want to like especially on a slab if you put something too big somewhere yeah god damn like when you're trying to traverse or move like go move laterally on it it gets in your way so you've got to take all these little things and then health and safety is a huge part of it as well like if someone pulled a hole off the wall i don't know what would happen to you they'd have a big lawsuit on their hands but we have to take into a fact into account like things are safely put on a wall that they're like, you can't fall on anything. So there's all these little things that people don't take into account that we have to look out for. And over time, like that just becomes easier and you become faster at doing it. Like I remember the days where I couldn't even set two boulders in the day because it just took me so long. And now I can set, I've done like days where I've done like 14 boulders. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay, so, and right. even my personal climbing as well. Like there were times where like, I would set stuff that I couldn't climb. There's still stuff I set I can't climb. Really? Yeah. Not that because it's too hard, because sometimes it's too technical. Mm. Sometimes I can't move properly on it. And then someone else will get on it and piss up it. Mm. And I think that goes back to grading sometimes. It's like people forget that we don't really get, like in our day, we strip, set, test. Between that setting and testing point, we don't get a very long warm up. It's not like going to the gym in the evening and being like, okay, I'm going to do some fingerboarding to warm up. I'm going to do some pull ups and push up. We're like, cup of tea. Theraband, maybe a bit of foam roller, and then we're climbing like V8 in a pretty quick time. 
like up to that sort of those grades like you we burn through the easy grades pretty quick and we tweak them and stuff and make sure they're right but then we're climbing some pretty hard boulders and you're pretty cold still so sometimes grading can feel hard because you're like oh am i warmed up enough will i come in tomorrow and it feels easier so there's a lot of variables so that's why i think yeah going back to the grading a little bit because it, it, it crossed in there like the the, the circuits kind of help out a bit because it may all feel really hard one day and then you get a day a rest day and you come back and bam you're it feels a lot easier or it feels a lot harder or even the weather as well yeah the weather takes a big play and especially because the the garden at mile end is outdoors like on the comp wall if it's a bit damp or it's hot in the summer you we, we set stuff in the summer and we were like if that was in october i'd piss up that yeah we always say stuff like that because we're like we know if it was like 10 degrees cooler this would be way easier stuff like that especially if you're climbing on like the holes made from fiberglass mm -hmm. that makes things tricky as well mm, wow that's amazing so that, that's that is really incredible what what are the, the the you know the health and safety concerns when you're when you're route setting yeah making sure like there's obviously like getting up things that like make sure the holes are flat to the wall make sure the holes aren't chipped in any places particularly like because obviously holes get damaged over time just from storage and wear and tear um we ger generally tend not to put anything too badly chipped on the wall but make sure that if there is there's nothing that's like you're able to like touch it like in the motion of where you're climbing like if it's underneath it where you never touch it like it might be okay but stuff like that making sure things aren't um gonna like push you in a certain direction like in the cave especially there's like the right hand wall you can't do certain moves because it fires you straight into the wall so like that would be unsafe because obviously you don't want people punting off like if they fall off and hit the ground when they hurt themselves that's a different story it happens all the time but if you can act if you set something that actively forces them into the wall in a in a bit of an uncontrolled manner like i've done it a couple of times in in my early stages and people were like oh no like you can't do that like change it back and then again like putting big holes at the bottom of a slab like especially if not even yeah. big if they're like if they're like if they stick out a lot and you could get stuck on it if it's like a massive imagine like imagine a wok like a frying pan wok but you you put it on so the like it's like bouncing out like the the, the outside of it's poking out if you hit that and you're gonna slide off right but if you had like something like that's quite sharp or a big like uh what's the word like tubular mm -hmm. so if that's a word to use um then like yeah you could get stuck on that like yeah. things, so things like that making sure that like yeah there's nothing that's gonna like empower you basically and things like that yeah it's sort of around those lines making sure the holes are fixed to the wall properly so um, they either get fixed on with a bolt or, or, or screws and obviously making sure the screws are the right length that go through the wall because the panels are like 18 mil thick so you've got to make sure that things like that and you just pick this up over time like right. all these little things and, and then it just becomes second nature you don't even have to think about that like you just you put stuff on and you know that makes perfect sense what's how route route setting in different gyms in even in London differs what what are the you know kind of uh, things that can differ the main things you'll find between the centers really is the the walls that you climb on themselves like some walls will be hand designed like myelin most of it was designed by alex um and um and different people different companies like the wall builders will like they'll communicate together and be like okay we want this and then there might be a middle person who helps design things a bit more in depth so there's layers to that and then some will just be almost like not prefab but there'll be companies that are a lot bigger and they'll just be like hey we have this amount of space like what can we fill it with and they kind of work in that aspect so really the walls is the is one of the main things mm. um and i think people do look at that more now um, and then maybe the holds is the second thing and the two main things really because not every center will have the same holds like we have stuff that other places don't have and other places have stuff that we don't have and i think that's kind of one of the cool things is like especially if you're a competitor and you want to compete you want to climb as many places as possible who have the most very amount of holds and we're quite lucky that we have a lot of holds for both our commercial sets like for the for the circuits and for the competition wall um, and we have a lot of stuff on the competition wall um and in the cupboard that that they're using the world cups and stuff so that's one of our like sort of unique selling points is mm. that you can climb v1 v2 on the comp wall but on like holes that they use in the world cups mm. and i think that's really cool and and the guys that beat us in they, they we did a seminar with them once and they were saying they're like don't use the best holds or like the most expensive holds for the hardest problems because only a small amount of people get to use those right. climb those but when we got a uh, loads of fiberglass in and it was like they were just out and like everyone was raving about them and they're awesome and i remember the first couple sets they were like v5s and v6s and v7s and then we put a set with a v3 and it was the most climb block in the center because mm. everyone was like those holds are awesome they're new like and 
everyone can kind of get on board with that. Like whether they climb it or not, they can try it. And I think that's what I really like to see is when you get to put some of those holds on like easy nice. and people just get stuck in and they love it. Yeah. So yeah, I think holds and that is definitely the, the things you'll find differently. And obviously the setters, like we have an in-house team uh, at my end of the three of us and we get guests in normally once a week on, on at least one of the sets. So we'll bring in a freelancer um, and some of them are pure freelancers. They only freelance around and some are like in-house uh, elsewhere, but get to freelance as well. So like I've been to, to a couple of walls in London now um, and worked with their in-house teams. And I've worked a couple of walls where they just have like staff who are in-house um, and like they in-house setters and then they bring in a lot of guests. So it kind of varies around. And I think it's nice that there's so much variety in London as well. Um, if, if you find a center and you're not too keen on it, like there are a lot of walls now. It's not like back in the day where it was like the arch, the castle, my land, Westway and the reach. And you'd be like, oh, if I don't like one, I've got to go really far to another. Like you can walk out of my land and if you don't like it and go to Beth Wall or, or Stronghold, they're yeah. like 10 minutes away. Yeah. So we are spoiled in London for that. For, for sure. sure. For sure. We're spoiled. Like, yeah. That makes sense. And when... I actually maybe have two more questions before we wrap it up. Yeah. What's the when you have a when you're designing a climbing wall? What's what? How are you gonna arrange your space? Is there are there some kind of rules about how you're gonna plan? So you're gonna put like well, there should be a bit of slab here, maybe an overhang there. Like, I don't actually know because I've not like obviously all the rebuilds that we've done. I've not really been that involved with because it's not really my my forte um but logistics wise i guess yeah like you obviously have to take into account like the flow of the center and like we had a large section of the main room at mile end rebuilt like a huge section of it so i guess we wanted to incorporate and re like replace what was there with similar stuff like there was one area that was a lot of technical climbing but it was just very outdated and now Which it's one? a lot the like the one we talked about before by the rope bay that little skinny bit and we call it area 51 by the rope bay. So you go in through the main, like the door to the main room, go left. It's that first one on the right before the rope Oh, the, like the, 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 the kind of like... Little channel. Like, like yeah. A, like a marina. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, like I a see. marina. And, it, and it's, it's in there, it's like very techy, like very yeah, technical I love based. That area. I like it because it's like, oh, you don't yeah. have to try hard. Like there are harder blocks in there, but generally it's more based around your movement. Yeah. Like I always try and focus on movement in there. Like the slab in there is really cool because we put no volumes or big holds on. So it feels a bit old school and a bit, a bit, yeah. a bit, gr a bit grotty. Like I some of the it. holds can be quite bad, but it's short and steep. And I like that. Yeah. Um, sorry, short and sweet, not steep. Whereas like, yeah, it's quite steep some, too. Yeah, some of the other slabs are taller and skinnier, so we've got variety as well. So I think, yeah, covering those ba those basic angles, sometimes people try, I guess like lots of centers want to have like big, unique things. Like we've got that big cave and it is really good, but then we do have some basic stuff. And I think that, I think people, setters, lots of setters I speak to quite enjoy just the gentle angles. Yeah. Because with the volumes, they create like more space really like they can make things deeper or shorter they can force you into different things like you can have a vert wall and a hundred volumes and you could make it different in one sense like every time um so it's not always about having like crazy barrels and stuff sometimes it is still nice to just have like we've got like i think it's like a 10 degree bit on the compo at the end and we all fight to get on that bit first because you've got like a great canvas and especially with the holds that we have you can do so much mm -hmm. But then I've been, actually, I really like the techie end on the end of the comp wall now. I'm two for two on like good blocks that I've been happy with. Mm -hmm. I set some, some fun stuff down there because it never is quite short on that end and it never looks that hard, but you can really mess with people in it. Mm. There's like really subtle angle changes that just like you can really force people's bodies into and I quite enjoy that as well. I enjoy setting stuff that makes me, like I set stuff that I suck at sometimes to make myself get better. Yeah, that, that's amazing. I mean, there is definitely something to be said about the fact that there will be some routes that you're gonna climb and there's you know you almost forget them instantly and there yep. will be other ones that you will yep. climb and you're like holy shit this uh, is yeah. amazing i remember indoor routes from years ago from like three i would say to people oh dude there was this pink on the side of the block it was v5 it was just before i went to font you had to do this this and this and it was amazing and people are like how do you remember these things i'm like no i shouldn't but yeah. sometimes you do stick around and i think if you can set a block like that that people are like Damn, that was like memorable. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, exactly. Is there is there is there a difference between how you set for bouldering and how you set for rope? Yeah, mainly the logistics. Like obviously, on a boulder set, you're on a ladder because you're not going very high. On a rope, uh, at my end, we have to set on a rope, so we have a, a static line setup. I won't go into any detail because yeah. people might try and, and and 
fuck up. Um, but yeah, we have a whole system. So like, you normally have to be quite competent at actually setting before getting on a rope because you have to worry about more than just that. Like hauling, lugging shit up and down. Alex Fryer is one of the guys who taught me a lot about that. And he's probably one of the fastest setters on a rope in the country. He just has like all the, all the knowledge. Um, so I'm thankful. Like that's one of the good things about having guest setters is you do learn a lot because like you, like you asked me about how to get into the industry, it's quite hard in one sense. There's definitely going to be more demand for setters in the future. And I think, um, like I said, with less headsetters, there's less people to teach it. But we're lucky that like there's a, a, a crew of guys at Impact Root setting. Um, give them a look up on Instagram if you're interested in trying out a day of setting. Like they run different courses, different abilities, and they run like in-house training as well. So it's quite a cool that like, there's like almost like a consultancy side happening, which I guess is part of the future development that we were talking about. So those guys are covering that base. And then I know the Root Setting Association, they run like two levels of courses and they revolve more around the safety side of things mm. and the logistics, which is great, um, less, but less the creative side, which Impact kind of does. So that's a kind of a good avenue to get in with um, for sure. So I think if you're looking to get into it, touching on that a little bit before we end is, is to either work at a wall, which is obviously quite hard sometimes, um, get friendly with the setters, ask them questions. Like we're always generally happy to talk to people, but you do have to remember sometimes that like we are trying to do our job. Yeah, and, and, and like as much as we want to spend 10, 15 minutes talking to every person, like we don't have that time. Like, um, but in our spare time as well, we do get quite excited to chat to people. Like I always quite getting feedback, but then sometimes I'm just there to train. So I don't really want to talk to you at the same time. That makes sense. But, but yeah, it ebbs and flows. But I think, yeah, for people wanting to, to, to sort of get into it, like, yeah, you just gotta, you gotta do a lot of hustling. Like, is, has Myland been or is offering an apprentice for a route setting or is it like... We, we have been, we're, we're taking a bit of a break at the moment just while me and Jack sort of get our feet going with the full-time roles and, and getting that sorted, sorted out um, and just getting the, the training just a little bit more consistent as well. Like it was like, because like I said, I was, the, I was the, the guinea pig for it sort of thing. Like we sort of saw which parts worked really well and what parts were lacking a little bit and I think we want to try and reformulate it so it, it caters a bit better. Um, and we're just waiting as well because we had another setter who left and we're just waiting to see whether we replace them or whether we just bring more guests in. We're not really sure yet. Fair. But places are like Impact do have a, an apprentice, I think, who works at Yonder because they work with them. And then I know like the vo the guys of Vauxhall, they have quite a lot. They have so many centers now. They do have quite a lot of apprentices. But generally, like it is people who work there. Yeah. Um, but that's not to say that you can't get into setting without free, like, just through freelancing. It's a lot harder, I think. Um, I'm kind of getting into the freelance game now and generally... Um, to get into setting most people are pretty strong and pretty competent climbers already and I went a bit backwards and it's not to say that you can't get into setting if you climb like V3 to V6 or V5 but like it's a lot harder because when yeah. you're on the sets like when it comes to testing like you all of a sudden like you can't go any further and like, yeah. like and there's days where like you've got to test like three V6s and a V8 or something like or on the comp where you've got like multiple hard blocks like you've got to be in pretty good shape. Sometimes it feels like, and you can't work every day. Like there's not many people who are working five days a week route setting because it's just so hard on your body. Right. Like Matt VC is one of the few guys I know who can do it and he's a freak. Like I love him. He's, uh, I text him. I did, I, did, I did a four day a week and the first thing I text him was like, how the fuck do you do this every week? And he does like five day and he, he's on the national team. Like he's a, and he, he'll do like five days and then almost go for a comp and I'm like, you're mad. Wow. So yeah, it's, it's a tricky thing to navigate. There's, there's, some, there's more information and like, more resources coming around online and I, and I would hope maybe like I know this might be the like I feel like this is just basic knowledge for me but I spent a long time trying to find podcasts and films and stuff about route setting it's quite hard to get into like to even to find like information but there are a lot of stuff out there so I yeah give it a plug yeah no like for sure I'll, I'll send it out to some people because I'm sure like even if you put route setting in the title when it goes on Spotify when you're talking route setting there's not many podcasts yeah so hopefully this would get picked up and people can listen to me chat yeah. shit for whatever it's like yeah I know but man. like but, but it's somewhere to start like in the UK yeah like it's it's tricky to get into like it and uh, play lots of places with COVID moved in house as well so I think that opportunities might be less but will come back because again there's more and more walls opening so I think it's just like getting to know people networking is a huge part of anything really and I, and it's sad that like yeah like in the setting game you do have to get quite good with networking and um, and knowing the right people like having to sort of get yourself in there a little bit but that's just the way yeah. things work but I would say like if you're keen on it like like even maybe message one of the headsetters at one of the walls and just ask for maybe some advice on what they would do um, if you're a freelancer and you want to get into a wall speak to the headsetter like that's normally the best way of doing it Instagram has become like the portfolio 
for root setters now. Like there are setters who may be like maybe less experienced than other setters, but they're hot on social media and they get more work. But then there's people you would rank maybe better than them who were just more word of mouth. Yeah. So it's it's interesting that like the industry is changing in that sense as well. Like yeah, Instagram's a big thing because like they want to see what you can do. Not only what you can do as a climber, but what you can set. Like normally your first set as a guest will be on slab. Right. Because it's like, can you climb? Yeah. Like you have to be good a good decent enough climber to climb on slab. You can't just be strong. Yeah. So fair fair play. A couple of little nugs for that. Um one one last question before we wrap it up. But before I do that, um if you have a Instagram where you publish your work and you wanna plug it in right now, oh, okay, go cool. for it. <laughs> yeah, my... or if you wanna plug plug give a plug to anything else, I'll also go, go for it. Loads of people. Um, Definitely. My one's just Dan Donovan one. Uh, so it's Dan and then my surname D O N O V A N because I pronounce it wrong because that's just my accent. Um, you can find find my, all my setting stuff on there. I uh, kind of like I have my Instagram is like set up between like root setting, climbing, boat stuff kind of just a general life thing and then I have my work one for my photography stuff which is on there um, check out like obviously Mylan Climbing Wall our team and then we've got Alex Lamel and, and Jack uh, Basato uh, they're the other in-house guys who work with me and then I don't know you can just sh- like check out all our guest setters um, they do a sick job I feel like yeah I'm, and I, just too, I think there's too many but then I guess yeah for any other impact uh, any, any other route setting stuff like for training look at impact they do a really good job Ben, ben and Kaylin uh, uh, are pushing things in the industry I think and, and starting something new that's quite exciting um, and then like uh, what's the good one for grips there's loads there's so many holds I'm just trying to think of there's like one, uh-huh. one, one good page that shows them all. Grip Geek is quite good for that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you can look up polls everywhere. Like Climbing Business Journal as well is an American site that does a lot. Or like, and they, they show you all sorts of things. So yeah, yeah, good stuff. Good stuff, man. Thank you so much. And one last thing before we close it. What's, what's the thing with frequency of changing the set on... on, on on the oh how quickly yeah uh, they normally have a light like for us I think between like four and eight weeks for boulder stuff and then like 12 to 16 I think it's for rope stuff mm. so obviously ropes like doesn't need to be set as often because people project things a little bit longer because they're obviously longer routes but boulders I think now like if you leave them on too long people get bored yeah and you've got to find that middle ground like we had the comp ball at one point was like every three weeks which I thought was awesome because it was like less problems every three weeks but then like it wasn't all like sometimes it's not like financially viable some customers do get annoyed you can't basically the rule one rule with root setting you can't keep everyone happy yeah you could bring in the best team in the world you could bring them on in the world cup teams you could bring in like every six hour onto a set and someone won't be happy like yeah. customer someone won't they'll be like oh, i don't like that like you literally like you could put a crack a paddle dyno like a knee bar invert thing whatever what's they a paddle were. dyno paddles where like you have to like you go with like both hands, but like you use the momentum to go to another. Oh, and you spend that quite. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. easier when you see it with my hands. Yeah, so yeah, yeah I see what you. But mean. look it, look it up on 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 YouTube. You're about to find it. Oh, actually, I tell you, host is really good. If you want to know about root set and stuff, it is Schnicky. Big up Nicky Held. He has like one of the best YouTube accounts for breakdowns of comps and stuff. And he's also an incredible setter, and he's hilarious. He's a German guy. I set with him once, and uh, and I met him in in Germany when I was competing. Mm. Um, so yeah, he's another another good one. If you want like actual resources on setting and stuff, he's a good person. He he gets into loads of events and stuff uh, and interviews people as well. And he's a good character. Nice. He's a, he's a top guy. Like yeah, there's loads of people like that as well. Like there's so many setters I could shout out, but it would take me all day. Yeah. Uh, but like he, he's definitely <clears throat> he's definitely one. <clears throat> if you're keen on like the especially the movement side of things, like I watch his videos and he breaks down like the World Cup boulders and stuff. And I think he's working in partnership sort of with the IFSC to like get the footage and stuff so that like you can get good quality. Um, and the only, only other one for, for movement is, is Udo Neumann, another German guy, because the Germans are just phenomenal at climbing uh, and movement. Yeah, Udo Neumann's like one of the OG coaches as well. He's been through the game a long time. Um, and his Instagram's Udini. So it's like U-D-I-N-I. Yeah, yeah he's, he's- Like Udini. Yeah, because he, he's, he's a- He's bit, a magician. He's right? a magician, yeah. yeah. He's very good. So yeah, like those guys, like if you want to get more information on movement and things like that definitely look at them but then yeah there's so many walls now like you look at the walls in japan and like some of the like pinnacles now so you look, look those up like b pumps a big inspiration to us um and like flash in in germany is another one so you can find so many walls and inspiration everywhere mm. but sometimes finding like the actual information is hard like you know you can just go out and get an impact driver and some bits 
and you know how to put the holes on the wall, but then like actually do you know how, how to put the holes on the wall? It's a different, yeah. different topic. Mm, fair play. Well, I like to think of climbing, indoor climbing as it's, it's like a weird combination between like Salvador Dali and like Picasso because there's all yeah. those weird yeah. shapes and colors yeah, and definitely. you know it feels a little bit trippy when you Sometimes, enter a climbing yeah, gym. For sure. And that's why I do like it when everything like when we I hate when we open the set and within like the next couple of days there's so much traffic they get it gets wrecked but the color scheme that we have on our walls I really enjoy it. Mm. Even though there's colors we don't have I know we don't have them because they won't I love mint like mint green is one of my favorite colors but it will look crap on our walls because yeah. we have like our color scheme doesn't match that and then I go somewhere else and I'm like oh mint green holes yeah. it's good. like things like that makes a big difference and people don't always notice that like you might have like a dark green circuit and a black circuit but when the dark green gets dirty or it's in a place where it's not well lit you can't see it so there's all these crazy little things that goes into it and like we overlook it sometimes I guess as setters because it's so such a norm to us but the journey that I've had to do like I've learned a fucking lot I guess like there's a lot that's had to had to happen Say it again. Like I've had to learn like all these little things. Oh like, yeah. yeah, there are layers to this game. So many aren't layers there? to this game. Yeah, when I think back and I'm like, damn, there's a, like, it was even like when we were washing holes the other day. I was like, I couldn't even wash like four buckets in a day, like let alone doing all this by myself. So it's nice to see the progression. Like, you do get these milestones as you get through setting, which are quite yeah. quite achievement. Like guest setting now is like the big thing for me. So um, I'm looking forward to more of that. Yeah, I hope I hope it happens to you, man. I climbed some of your stuff and it's amazing. Oh, thank you. Holy shit, Dan Donovan, we smashed it. Sick. No, that was good. amazing. Thank you. thank you so much.